Welcome. Oops. Uh, please uh, give an, an other round of applause to the trio Arauco. Wait. Uh, playing the charango, the perco percussion, and uh, the, un the un flute was Fernando Torres and Jorge Tapia. And the guitar and the song, the one and only Rafael Manriquez. Good afternoon. I'm Harley Shaken, uh, the director of the Center for Latin American Studies, and we're delighted to invite you to UC Berkeley this afternoon. For us, it is a great honor to welcome back President Michelle Bachelet to Berkeley. When she was here two years ago, she came to deepen links between a state and a country that share many things, from trade to democratic values, from stunning mountains to fertile valleys. When she was here, she signed a Chile-California agreement and a Chile University of California agreement to strengthen and deepen our ties. And she received this university's highest honor, the Berkeley Medal, for her extraordinary contribution to human rights and her country's progress. And as if to ratify Berkeley's far-sightedness in offering her this award two years ago, when she left office a little over a month ago, she left office with an 85% approval rating. <laughs> So I think it's safe to say most Chileans agreed with us. She, Michelle Bachelet, has received much praise for who she is and how she is led. Before she even became president, Hillary Clinton wrote, quote, when I heard that Michelle Bachelet was running for the presidency of Chile, I was enthralled. Near the end of her term last summer, President Obama hosted her in Washington, D.C., and remarked, I find her one of the most compelling leaders that we have, not just in the hemisphere, but around the world. President Bachelet is surely all these things, but she is truly something more as well. She is someone who has walked through Chile's darkest night, with courage, determination, and hope. And she is someone who has led her country to imp impressive, unprecedented heights with that same courage, determination, and hope. She understands and has shown that expanding human rights enriches lives, that democracy is not simply an abstract concept, but a lived experience. She encouraged, she successfully encouraged economic growth through innovative policies, but she's placed an equally strong emphasis on social protections and equity through equally innovative policies. The result is not simply enrichment for a few, but a better life and real promise for the many. She looks towards the future while not forgetting, in fact, re-encountering the past. Tonight, President Bachelet will first speak and then engage in a conversation and answer written questions that have come over the internet and that you have cards. We, we encourage you to write short, uh, single questions and we'll be collecting the cards and asking some of those after her talk. And of course, we will conclude with a Quaker. 
Let me now introduce Professor Beatrice Montz, whose soul still lies somewhere between the southern shores of the Pacific Ocean and the snow-capped peaks of the Andes. Thank you very much. Well, President uh, Michelle Bachelet really doesn't need uh, introduction here in Berkeley. She was here before, and we can tell from the audience here that uh, we all know her past and what she has accomplished. Uh, but I should say, as a woman, and as a Chilean, and as a member of this community, it is truly an honor and a great pleasure to introduce Michelle Bachelet. She cares about human rights and democratic values and has led us to a better world. And I think Chile will never be the same again. So let me just say, please, démosle una gran bienvenida a la Presidenta Michelle Bachelet. Thank you very much. Well, friends of um, University of California, Berkeley, dear friends, Harley Shaken and Beatrice Manz from the Center of Latin American Studies, um, Consular Corp, Chilean Consul, Mr. Alex Geiger, professors, students, friends. Well, let me begin by thanking the University of California, Berkeley, for inviting me again, and for your kind words, Harley and Beatrice, also. Well, now as a former president, to be here and share a few minutes and, well, not a few minutes, a few moments and a few ideas uh, with you. Um, as uh, Harley uh, Shaken said, in 2008, I had the pleasure to sh share uh, also some talks with people from your community, and I received the tremendous honor of the uh, University of California Berkeley Medal, so again, thank you very much. I also wish to especially acknowledge uh, the constant historic relationship between the University of California and Chile, and this is, reflects, I think, the important relationship between California and Chile ever since the 19th century. We all know for the times of the legend Joaquin Murieta, mentioned in Isabel Allende's magnificent novel, Daughters for, uh, Fortune's Daughter, to the 1965 Chile-California plan, together with the University of Chile, plan that, as uh, Harley just remember, we relaunched in 2008 during my government with a view of now improving productivity and competitiveness and sharing, I would say, with mutual interest, mutual opportunities and mutual capacities. And we, we signed with, between Chile and the state of California and with the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and more recently, we have always been uh, uh, in relation uh, to the terrible earthquake that on February the 27th struck the central region of Chile from Santiago to almost the lands where Beatrice uh, comes. Uh, you know me very well, I suppose, that the central region of Chile has a lot of similarities to California, climatically, geographically. And this university has been a constant partner on that long road that has been the history of Chile. For all these things, I thank you very much, very much from the bottom of mine, I would say, in the name of many Chileans who are here and who are in our country, of our heart. This is the first speech I give in an English-speaking country since I left the presidency. However, I do so as former president of a country that in recent years has been able to make great strides uh, in its development. Chile is today not only a consolidated democracy, Chile is also a society that has reached an average growth rate of over 5%, 
has more than doubled its national product and is almost had tripled its per capita income. But to talk about the progressive shift and the Chilean path, we need to talk about as long as 20 years. And even though we Chileans, and probably there are some Argentinians here, there is, and not only Argentinians, Latin Americans, and maybe some French Americans know a tango called Volver. In Volver it says 20 years is nothing. <laughs> and of course, compared to the history of the planet, 20 years is nothing. But for us, 20 year, years has meant a lot. It is a nation that in the 20 years since regaining its democracy, reduced its poverty rate from almost 40 to 13%, and extreme poverty from 20% to 3%. And it is a country that over the last four years built a social protection network that covers its citizens from the cradle to old age, and it did, and it did it, and we did it in the midst of the economic crisis. We were able to do so because we implemented counter-cyclical policies that allow it to become one of the strongest emergent, emergent economies in the world, placing it in one generation on the roads towards becoming a developed economy. But all of this is probably all news for you. So I want to center my remarks today on a few of the fundamental ideas which lie behind the construction of today's Chile the Chile we have built since recovering our democracy in 1990. And perhaps the first and most important lesson is political. I'm referring to the need to understand democracy as an end in itself, as a space for reaching and renewing agreements, and not as a tool for special interests willing to dispose of it as soon as it does not serve its supposed purposes. That is why in Chile we never say that we have built a new country or that we, we need to construct a new Chile. That would be presumptuous and counterproductive because it's, there's one lesson that at least a majority of Chileans have learned is that Chile and other countries like it have no future if they continue to see themselves, as some academics have called it, a nation of enemies. We will go nowhere if we do not understand that democracy is not a platform for messianic projects, but rather a space when diff where different projects, views, and opinion converge in the interest of the great objectives we share as a society. I know this sounds great, and it sounds easy, and of course, it's not easy. It involves enormous cost, perseverance, and I can tell you, a lot of patience. Because its success depends on perseverance and incrementalism, which for societies with great social needs can often seem unbearably slow. And the pressure for creative alternatives is great. But history has taught us that the costs of this alternative path are infinitely greater. History has also shown that if we were able to reach broad agreements over time, the fruits of democracy would ripen. That has centrally been the Chilean experience. Chile is, if I may say, a successful democracy. Imperfect? Yes. Unresolved problem? Of course. But not any more so than any other democracy. Yet it is democracy itself which allows us to carry out a process which does ultimately deliver the public goods that our citizens and their children expect, but not only expect, I would say deserve. Our per capita GDP measured in purchasing power parity terms reached $15,000 this year, despite the effects of the crisis. In five years, we ex expect to reach uh, 20,000, the level of many developed countries in the 80s and 90s. But even though I want to acknowledge that this estimation could have changed uh, due to the terrible consequences of the earthquake and tsunami, uh, that uh, struck uh, Chile in, in, in February. But one important aspect of our agreement reaching capacity is the ability to modify and adjust those agreements as the, prog as the country progresses. So whereas in 1990 our fundamental agreements may have been precarious, limited to democracy and the maintenance of an open market economy, 
and the need to avoid an authoritarian regression, over time we have been able to widen and deepen this accord, those accords contributing to the consolidation of our democracy. For example, in 1990, uh, when we regained democracy, General Pinochet remained as head of the army. Yet, in the year 2000, the country had reached new consensus on human rights in which the armed forces accepted the need to try and punish those responsible for human rights violation, as well as the responsibility of handling over whatever information might be useful for the courts in this regard. So while it is true that none of the military leaders who led the coup d'etat in 1973 ever faced trial, all those involved in repression are today either on trial or in prison, and the courts continue to investigate hundreds of cases. Yet, no one in Chile feels that democracy is in danger. On the contrary, it gets stronger every day. A second lesson to the Chilean experience is the need to achieve a greater balance between democracy, the market, the state, and sustainable development. One of the key of Chile's development was to accept in 1990 the need to have a strong state to bring about growth with equity. So we said at that time, and during my government too, we need to, in able to grow, we need to include. In, in, and we have to include to grow and grow to include. There is a symbiotic relationship in, in between both. And you don't have to make a trade-off between economical growth and equal opportunities or social justice. Even though in 1990, uh, the world was still dominated by the neoliberal paradigm that only came, I would say, as a discussion at the end of 2008 because of the crisis. It is true that in the 80s, Chile was a neoliberal laboratory. It was one of the first cases where these policies were implemented. That is why we also learned very early on of the great social cost of neoliberalism, of the social deficit it created. So in 1990, we embarked upon a policy of growth with equity, an idea that would evolve, mature, conceptually and politically. Conceptually, we abandoned the old idea of the old welfare state, which in Europe was in crisis and has led, in fact, to the appearance of neoliberalism. But we also left aside those policies which were exclusively contribution-based, focused merely on individual savings and private insurance, and channeled direct support only for the poorest, poorest, poorest sectors. We move, in other words, towards a new model based on democracy and social rights, its policy would offer support and universality as befitting a modern welfare state founded on the conviction that the state must recognize and guarantee certain civil, political, and especially social rights to all of its citizens. And not only for those who have the money for the private insurance, which of course we have kept. Experience has taught us that in the end, rights are indivisible, a good deal of the current global discontent with democracy comes from its incapacity to generate, generate real equality of opportunities and to supply the public goods required to improve people's life. I mean, democracy has to deliver. Otherwise, people is not happy with it, of course, because their lives are not getting any better. In other words, in Chile, we learned that while democratic rules are totally, completely, and absolutely indispensable, they are not enough. Achieving all this demands rigorous fiscal and political discipline. It imposes an obligation to save in the good times so that you can spend or invest when the times get tough. It demands guaranteeing social rights over time rather than having to cut back benefits when the condition, as it is in the case today, are not the best. This is not easy, and even more so in times of crisis. The challenges are formidable, although not insurmountable. And there are several countries in our own region that have demonstrated that we can succeed. And I think Chile has done so. We implemented a counter-cyclical policy, and we saved when the price of copper was high, allowing us to increase social spending on the year 2009 when the country, its economy was, was contracting, we were able to uh, increase social spending by 7.8%, plus 
precisely at the time when we were being hit the hardest by the crisis, and precisely, of course, when our people needed it the most. And this is why, at the end, I think the main lesson progressive policies have shown in Chile is that in Latin America, but also in the rest of the world, you can be popular without being populist. Friends, Chile will continue to face many challenges in the future, especially, of course, after the earthquake. But it is also very clearly moving forward, together with the rest of Latin America, on the road toward development. And as I said at the beginning, the, the national crisis was a big blow for Latin America. It put the brakes to a long cycle of economic growth that allowed, in six years, to lift 37 million Latin Americans out of poverty, this on top of a food crisis. However, democratic Latin America confronted the crisis better than on previous occasions, and better than other regions, and now is starting to recover. The challenge now is how to transform this recovery into sustained growth and prosperity, collective prosperity for the citizens of Latin America. And this, the region faces three challenges that are intimately related. First, consolidation of democracy. Second, increase innovation and productivity. And third, increase regional and world integration. Democratic consolidation became a clear challenge after the crisis in Honduras. It's clear that during the last 25 years, there have been close to 20 interruptions of duly elected government. And this clearly shows us the centrality of this subject for a region. We can say, well, we have democratic governments, uh, but democracy is not fully consolidated. According to some, some people, some scholars, democracy in Latin America is under a perpetual crisis, so we need to be permanently alert. Others, more pessimistic, consider that the democratic spirit has been hurt and it's leading to a sort of democratic recession in some countries. As a doctor, I always believe that we need to prevent and not take for granted a democracy's health. And what do I mean by saying this? I mean we have still a lot of work to do. Uh, monitoring the real situation of democracy in Latin America and taking care specifically on three central elements. First, consolidation of institution and rule of law. Because if democracy is a regime of freedoms, we need to strengthen it and enforce it. Second, increase people's empowerment, people participation, and people's social and political involvement. Because representative, democra dem representative democracy is just not enough. And third, democracy, as I said before, has to deliver, providing or assuring certain public goods or social rights, however you want to put it, to its citizens. Uh, as Carlos Fuentes used to say, and I quote, democracy has to be synonym, too, of welfare, equality, and dignity. To consolidate democracy in Latin America requires the total acceptance of democratic rules of the game, but as I said before, it's not enough. There are new pressures. Free and competitive elections, civil liberties, and respect for human rights are, without any doubt, this, the essence of democracy. Personal guarantees, free electoral authorities, freedom of thought, of religion, of the press, and of association must be respected. Although most Latin American states respect civil liberties and individual guarantees, in many places people cannot exercise those rights because of the inequalities of those societies or, in others, fear of organized crime. We must then defeat organized crime, corruption, inefficient judicial systems, and where it is, police brutality. But we must also provide some minimum public goods and seriously reduce inequalities, and seriously tackle poverty. This last point is especially true in Latin America because during the 80s and 90s, the social dimension did not receive the same attention as democratization and economic modernization did. And I should say every time I, 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 I attended, when I was a president, the international meetings regarding uh, the financial and economic crisis, or when you read the statements of uh, G20 or others, I still think that the social issue is the one less taken into consideration. 
And I think we have to worry about it because it couldn't be possible that after the social, the, the, the financial and economic collapse, uh, we will have a social collapse, and we have to prevent that. Because to, to not take into consideration enough the social dimension produces a lot of suffering to many people, but also produces an erosion of the democratic legitimacy that was so built, that difficult to build in Latin America. And we cannot wait any longer to move towards a society of freedoms, equal rights, and equal opportunities, which offers benefits to all, and not only to some privileged minorities. I believe it is in this area that the success of economic and social policy in countries, such as Chile, such as Brazil, such as many others, will be so important. Because we are told that in our regions, a few countries are adopting populist policies. But there are many others who have opted for progressive policies aimed at reducing deficits. And when I'm talking deficit, I'm talking, of course, fiscal, but mainly social and democratic deficit. And these policies are working. And because we have seen how, even in countries where central and or central right-wing parties have come to power, like in Chile, they have accepted the need to implement or maintain the redistributive policies that we progressive have supported for so long. And I hope they'll do so. All this goes to show how we stand before an historic, historic opportunity to establish new consensus in the region and take another great step toward democratic consolidation. So while in this case, it might seem like a victory for progressives, the real winners are the democratic systems themselves. The second challenge is an innovation, meaning, uh, sustained growth, productivity, competitiveness, integration. Prices of the principal Latin American exports have doubled or tripled in recent years. And the challenge for Latin American countries is to take advantage of this situation and lay the foundation for stable growth and a less volatile uh, macroeconomy. During the last few years, until the start of the present crisis, Latin America and the Caribbean achieve a dynamic export market and better access to target markets. However, as far as competitiveness goes, there is still much work to do. And the real challenge in this area lies in improving our productivity levels, diversifying production and export bases by incorporating more value and knowledge into the goods and services being exported. And this requires a change of attitude. It requires leadership from those in power. Fortunately, many of us learned the lessons from past mistakes. And during the last few years, we did not spend in Chile. We invested in our own productivity. And here, in, in, in years 2008, I announced the fund for what it was called, it was a very long name and not very pretty name, for a, fund, a bicentennial fund for advanced cap human capital. But what it meant, it was $6,000 million dollars that, um, that were, uh, I mean, that we had because of the high prices of copper, we earmarked for exactly uh, helping young people uh, getting uh, more training, capacitation, and uh, going everywhere in the world where the best places are, and of course, Berkeley, naturally, and uh, so, uh, and, and pay by the state, because we needed people being in the front line of, uh, of, uh, of the, the development of science, technology, and so on. So that's why I say we invested in, in, in our own uh, development and productivity. We invested intensely in education, technological transfer, and infrastructure, with a special focus on competitiveness. When I say this, I am not mean that the work was done. I mean, we did this, but of course, we have to continue working, and there's much more to do. Finally, the region must move in the direction of more regional and international integration. The share of intra-regional export in relation of total exports increased from 14% in 1990 to 20% in 2008. But it, this is still way below intra-regional trade levels which exist in the European Union, in NAFTA, or in the ASEAN members. In other words, there's little integration of the region's manufacturing chains. Greater intra-industry intra trade within the region would lead to greater interdependence, less volatility to in, in, inter-regional trade, 
and also to a strengthening of mutual economic links. This would allow for growth of the larger economies, but also for support for growth of the smaller ones. It also shows high cost of interregional trade, and we must. Um, and this is uh, uh, the high cost is consequence of a lack of adequate infrastructure, poor logistics, and high administrative costs. And much can be done. For example, uh, Chile, Bolivia, and Brazil, with the three presidents, develop a bio-oceanic corridor, 3,000 kilometers long, from Santos in Brazil through Bolivia and ending in Iquique and Arica in Chile. So, and connecting Atlantic with Pacific and providing lots of possibilities. Solving this issue would, be, would also greatly increase Latin America's competitiveness, attract foreign investment, and promote diversification of export to the rest of the world. Greater integration will allow us to take better advantage of the opportunities offered by this common region the Asia-Pacific region. We must build commercial alliances, produce synergies, and strengthening productive complementarity in line with the 21st century economy. But I must insist that all this requires a new approach. I did not mention, but of course, all of this has to be think and rethink and push with the idea of green recovery, energy, new renewable energies, and so on. Nothing that I have mentioned here is impossible. On the contrary, history is full of realities that were once thought to be impossible. Decades ago, it seemed impossible that many countries of the third world would catch up to developed countries. Three decades ago, democracy in Latin America was a dream. Today, we must prove that democracy can integrate liberty, opportunity, welfare, and citizenship. This dimension must go hand in hand with democratic procedures to ensure that they offer a qualitative and quantitative improvement in the quality of life of our peoples. We must leave behind uh, us years of regional political antagonism and must work together to face a dynamic new world. And more than anything else, we must move forward on concrete issue and not get trapped in rhetorics. My friend, all of this is what we have started to do in Chile, and it remains the focus of our struggle in the years ahead. And I'm sure that we continue working, understanding that we can think on a countries that can be successful in economic growth, but on the same hand, can be very successful in providing to a citizen better conditions of life, that it is possible. Chile has made it possible. It doesn't mean that there are not any uh, enormous amount of challenges, of problems that can have to be solved. But uh, I say this, that we have to have hope for Latin America, because it can be done. Every country will find its way of doing it. But um, it is finally what our peoples of our of our uh, region deserve, and that they are waiting for the leaders to to be a, to produce this possibility or have a better place to live for everyone, and uh, that's what we try to do uh, in our country, and we will continue now, not as a president, but as a former president, working for better conditions of life in Chile and Latin America, wherever I would be. Thank you very much. All the best for you. Well, now, after that wonderful talk, we begin a conversation and seeking to answer some of the questions that you've asked here. And also, we have two other sources of questions. Uh, questions that came over the internet, which the Center for Latin American Studies does for all large events like this. And this time, we've solicited some questions from a broad community 
that's really part of the Center for Latin American Studies in the United States and throughout Latin America. So I'm actually gonna start with one of the questions uh, that we asked a person to write, and the person is Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, who represents a district in Southern California, who serves on the House Ways and Means Committee, and who's a very good friend of the Center for Latin American Studies, and I have to say, a close friend of many of us here at Berkeley. So the first question is from Linda Sanchez, and she writes, Chile's retirement plan has been seen since its enactment as the model of private individual retirement accounts. As the first generation of workers who've spent their careers under the system reach retirement, there has been criticism that the system provides inadequate benefits and has too great an administrative cost. Under the previous American administration, there was talk of privatizing the American social security system. Do you feel Chile's system works well for its people? And what reforms, if any, do you believe are needed? And finally, would you recommend that other nations follow the current Chilean model? <laughs> Well, fortunately, I can recommend the current Chilean model <laughs> because I made the reform of the, of the pension system. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Linda Sanchez was very right to say that um, the reform that was implemented on the 80s, um, after some years when people get retired, did not fulfill, I would say, the dreams uh, of the people and, and pensions were very low. Um, and also had uh, a lot of uh, different problems, like women had lower pensions than men. I mean, there was a lot of problems. So when I came into office, I decided, well, as a candidate too, that uh, the, the main reform that I would do during my four-year term would be the reform of the pension system. Uh, and we wanted to solve many things. We wanted to solve this so low pensions, we wanted to solve the problems of women in two different dimensions. One, the one just I just mentioned, that somebody uh, doing the same thing for all his life as a man would receive a lower pension. And I think I spoke about that in 2008. It's because we have bigger expectancy of life. You know, we are tougher to kill women. <laughs> uh, and. Um, Start to die, I would say. <laughs> and, um, and then they, they took a little bit of our pensions, you know, so they could last longer. Mm -hmm. That was real. That was how it worked. So we, and the other thing we wanted to, to solve is so many women, housewives, who have work in its house with its families, with children, but never receive any payment or any salary. So we introduced, say, uh, uh, during my government, uh, pension system reform that uh, gave, for the first time in her life, housewife, uh, aging house, housewife, uh, its own pension. And we thought that was very important because at, until then, women were considered a burden of the, of the husband. Uh, many husbands can consider maybe a burden his wife, but really, <laughs> as a society, I believe this is unacceptable. And, uh, be, and also because we believe that women, or, or men, I mean human beings, has to be subject of rights. And we wanted to dignify their lives. Um, so we introduced this pension that they have been receiving since the 1st of July 2008. We started, it, it's, I spoke about incrementality. Because every reform we have done in our country, we have made it very responsible. And with this concept that I also talk about, not to have to, uh, how you say that? Um, set back is the word? No, to cut back benefits mm -hmm. if the economy mm -hmm. is not going well. So we designed the reforms and we put into sovereign funds reserves. So if the economy won't, get, it won't be well, we don't have to cut benefits for the people. So we can assure they will continue receiving benefits when they have to. And uh, that's why we started with 40% uh, 
of the old people with this new system. Uh, last year, in the 1st of July 2008, the 1st of July, every year, we increase the number of people receiving uh, this new form of pension. Uh, and, and, and the 1st of July 2008, uh, we, we went into the 45 percent. But I think the crisis was going on. The 1st of September, I advanced one year the reform, and we went into the 50 percent. And in 2011, the 60 percent of the population of Chile will be receiving pensions. The other 40 has enough uh, salary to have uh, pension, so it's not the group that they need a special attention. And women not only will receive this pension, but also we thought how we deal with this issue that women live longer, and how we deal with that. There was a lot of different technical possibilities, but we decided at last to give a bonus for child born alive or dead, and for adopted kids uh, that would be received by the woman the day they retired. So in that sense, we solved two problems, if I may say. The difference between the pension from a woman and a man. Se and second, the idea of the children are responsibility of the whole society. So we are all part of this, and so women will receive better pensions, uh, or at least not better than men, don't get worried. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but the pensions they deserve. So if you ask me if we recommend, yes, but this new pension system, we fully recommend <laughs> but not the old one. <laughs> so I will send a copy of the, of the law to the, to the congressman. <laughs> <laughs> and also of the... I'm sure she's disappointed she's not with us today, but yes. the Congress is in session, so since she's probably watching this, and this will be a live webcast and available on the web, I, she will see this and be expecting the envelope. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, next, I'm actually gonna group some questions that came on the cards from the audience right here. Uh, so I'll, I'll read three, and you'll see in a moment they're not exactly thematically related. Uh, the first one is, in Chile, you enjoyed wide popularity. Why do you think the Concertacion was unable to win the recent election? What do you see in the future with the Piñera administration? Uh, the second one, <laughs> uh, in this country, President Obama is accused for being a socialist, as if it were a plague. <laughs> How could you have been elected as a declared and underlined member of the Socialist Party? Uh, and finally, uh, Chile is always described as one of the most Catholic countries in Latin America. As an agnostic and a single mother, how do you explain your election and leaving office with an 84% approval rating? Well, I think the last two questions, uh, I would say many people is asking themselves, how was that possible? <laughs> <laughs> but I will try to answer. Um, well, I think um, the political forces that uh, are represented by the Concertación of, political, of, of Party for Democracy. I mean, I don't know how many of you know the history of Chile, but after the coup d'etat and when uh, political forces start, you know, re-regaining re, re again and trying to push towards democracy, there was a group of political parties that came together in the, that in the past were adversaries, were, uh, who believed that the common things were more important than the things that could uh, separate us. And decided to create, uh, uh, to, to bring a candidate to the presidency and to produce a program of the kind of society we wanted to have in Chile, a society with democracy, with freedom and equity, with growth and equity. And uh, that is the concertation of, of uh, parties for democracy. And it, has, it had been in 20 years in power and as you say, as you know, in 11 of March, uh, a new government, now central right, uh, came into office. The, the thing is, um, much has been said and asked, and I will tell you, 
They ask me this question everywhere I go. In Chile, out of Chile. <laughs> How is it possible that you did not transfer your approval to your candidate? Well, things are never mechanical. I mean, when President Lagos uh, finished his term, he went out with 60% of approval. And I was the candidate, and I was clearly his candidate. Uh, and in the first round, I got like 46%. And the second round, I got 53 or 54. So it's never mechanical, the transfer from one person to another. Uh, I always say that we, the, the Alianza is the name of the other coalition, the coalition that uh, leads uh, President Piñera. I always say that the Alianza did not win the Constitución uh, lose. And I think, I don't want to go into details now why I believe the Constitución was defeated, even though the government, I mean, the president had a great approval, but the government also, the cabinet has also a great approval, 80, 60%. Because I think it's, it, we need a little bit more time to make all the anal analysis that what happened. And I think Concertación needs to do those analysis and decide what went wrong, what happened, uh, why people did not trust us. And uh, this is what the parties there are doing. We're all doing that uh, to, and one thing, one thing I believe is key, not the, not the soul, but it is important. Is, and probably here, it's nothing so different that you might have heard here, is that the quality of politics needs to be increased. People were not happy with the kind of politics they were seeing every day, in parliament or in other places. And I think one of the main issues that must be um, um, taken into consideration and taken into care, I would say, is, and one of the things my foundation tries uh, to also uh, have uh, some work on it is how we can improve the quality of the politics because I am so convinced that interest groups are essential but the only ones who can build, uh, who can propose to a country a, a global perspective for, for the development of society are the political parties, is politics. Because social groups of interest are great, but they have specific interest. And the only one who can have this wide and strategic perspective are, of course, political parties. So I think we need pol strong political parties, asking themselves the essential questions of a society and giving answers and proposals to the people but putting in the central part of its of care or concerns the people. I mean, people need to see its politician working for them, trying to generate solutions for them, and not making, how could I say, being involved in small little things that don't take into consideration the people's needs. And during my government, we try always to put in the center of the public policies the people. And when it didn't work, we confronted the truth and said it didn't work. And we're going to work hard to solve this. And I think people really acknowledges honesty, acknowledges people are working for them and not with other kind of interests. And third, are working for the whole population, not only for a few, not only for your friends, if I may say. And uh, uh, I try to do that because I really believe, because what I've said there, I really believe it. Because we lost democracy, we need to take care of democracy. Cuidarla con mucho cariño. We cannot, I mean, it took us so much time and cost to build what we have been able to build that I don't know if that's the correct words in English air, we have to take care of it as a, something precious. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think we have to take it. Uh,
The two other question was unrelated in some way. Mm -hmm. How a country that is Catholic could elect a woman who is agnostic? Or how a country who defines itself, I mean, when you ask the Chileans, how do you define yourself politically? The majority puts, puts itself in center. And then it's a small curve to the left and to the right. But the majority of people see themselves as center. How do they elect these women? <laughs> Divorce, <laughs> socialist, <laughs> agnostic, <laughs> what else? <laughs> uh, <laughs> with my history, as I told the commander in chief when I was the minister of defense, I know that I have, I have all the capital things in it, but we'll work well. And we did. We did very well. And I think th the answer is related to what, just, what, I, what just, I just said. Um, I know when somebody calls President Obama a socialist, I suppose in his country, this country this has been considered as a bad word because that's probably what they're trying to do to give a bad image to President Obama. Uh, but the thing is that I think people are, are wise. People uh, are, are know what a president like President Obama is trying to do. Uh, and will not hear, how you call it in, 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 in English? ¿Cómo uh, se sirena? Sirena? No, no, la sirenita. Con... <laughs> Won't hear mermaid things, I would say. Mermaid things try to distract people from the essential issues. And if President Obama is trying to do important reforms, of course, there are mermaid sings or tunes uh, that try to, 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 that try, that people wouldn't understand exactly what's going on. I think there, there was people who thought they would never vote for me because I was a woman, first of all, because I was a socialist or an agnostic. But you know what? As they have known me as a minister, I mean, Mainly people trusted in me. And what I think is very important is to continue doing everything so people can continue trusting in you. And I'm sure and I hope that President Obama has a great success because he's a great guy, a great president, a great leader, and I love him. in a political way of saying I love him. So I hope Michelle don't get me wrong. Uh, I should point out, you reminded me of something. I introduced you at another event while you've been on campus. And I said that Michelle Bachelet was not simply the first woman elected president of Chile, the first woman elected in her own right in Latin America, was, but the first woman who was appointed defense minister in Latin America. But she corrected me and said, the first woman defense minister in all the Americas. So there's a bit of a challenge here. <laughs> but, now, excuse me, but let me tell you something. Um, it's so important, the thing of the role model, that now we have a lot. We have women in Argentina. We had in Ecuador, fortunately she had an accident, she died. We had in Uruguay. Uh, and so we have had, uh, we, it, after me was in Colombia. Uh, in France, Michelle Allumarie, now she's Minister mm -hmm. of Interior, but she was Minister of Defense. So uh, those sort of things uh, uh, can be contagious, you know, mm -hmm. contagious. <laughs> Now I'm going to go back to the internet for a moment with three questions. The first two we solicited from the broader community of the center. Uh, the first is from Javier Cusso in Santiago, Chile. He is a professor of law in Santiago and a Berkeley alum. Uh, his question is, what explains the enormous influence of finance ministers in the 
in the Concertacion governments? Uh, do you think you should have gone ahead with labor reforms aimed at increasing Chile's extremely low rate of unionization, 8% of the labor force? Uh, the second question is from Roberto Guareschi in Buenos Aires in Argentina. He is the former managing editor of Clarín in Argentina, and he writes, what was the hardest, or which were the hardest questions your administration had to deal with regarding Argentina? And... <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> and that we, we are going to limit that to a certain time. Uh, and finally, uh, the third question came over the internet, but the, uh, the sender identifies himself. Uh, he is Roberto Hernandez. He is a graduate student here in public policy, and he is the co-director of the award-winning documentary film, Presumed Guilty, about the criminal justice system in Mexico. Uh, and his question is, what was your role in the reform of the Chilean criminal justice system? Many say it is the best reform experience in Latin America. Do you agree? <laughs> well, um, I would say that uh, ministers of finance in any country do what they have to do. And they have to recommend the president some decisions. Well, they're economists, and no one's perfect. But uh, <laughs> this is a joke I always tell them, because uh, in our country, when I was elected president, they said, she's not an economist. She will know nothing to do. Huh? And, uh, but during the crisis, when nobody understood, and still, I don't know if many understand, and estimation were all wrong, Every week they change, and they were even wronger. So I said, what was that thing with the economist? <laughs> no, I think economy is central, and the finance minister are, in Chile, we have a finance minister and a minister of economy. And it's essential because a president needs to know exactly what is possible to do. I mean, which are the ranges that I have? Of course, as you can imagine, the minister of, Eco uh, of finance always wants little bit and you want everything more and more so but you take the decisions but you you need to know the possibilities that I'm talking about budget I'm talking about bonus of benefits and so on any any and I've met many Minister of Finance would like to maintain the macro balances and so on and, and not to get into any deficit and so on. But during the, 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 the crisis, we developed a fiscal plan that was what, the fifth bigger, biggest in the world uh, regarding the relation with the GDP. It was 2.8% of the GDP. And we came into a certain deficit, of course, but it was the moment to do it. I mean, what's, what, what were we saving for if people didn't have jobs, if the economy was contracting? So we said, okay, we behave well for many times. We were very responsible, but it was not just to save for saving, it's to save for the moment where the economy needed to. And that's what we did. And it had very good results because we could produce, uh, uh, help producing jobs. And while the... Um, the increment of uh, uh, job um, unemployment rate started at the end of 2008 and started increasing. Uh, in August, it stopped. It stopped, it stabilized, and then it continued down, 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 down. So it didn't work. And the economy started to recover. And we did not make any fiscal plan regarding financial system because our financial system had this terrible problems in the 80s. So we have just introduced the adjustment, adjustment, so we did not have the terrible financial crisis that you had. So what I mean to say is that the finance minister uh, proposed me that. Uh, we discuss, we improve, we, uh, uh, I, I told him, look, okay, let's do a lot of things, but poor people must not be paying the crisis. 
this is a party, we were not invited, and now we have to pay the cost. And the workers and the poor people won't pay it. And so let's find solution for that. Uh, of course, the, he speaks specifically of the labor reform. We were working on labor reform. Because as he mentioned, in Chile it's very low, very low. I'm thinking 7%, I think, of the working, uh, of the working force that has collective negotiation. Uh, there are some other kinds of negotiation, but collective negotiation. So we started making a law before the crisis. But, and so we started making it, trying to get into agreement between the business community and the workers. And we worked with both of them. And it came a, a project of law, a bill. But at the end, nobody liked it. The workers, the trade unions didn't like it. The business community didn't like it. And the members of parliament didn't like it. So why should I send a law that nobody liked? So I said to the minister, you have to continue working the best project bill. And then comes the crisis. And he said, OK, now we have to put it in the freezer, because now we have to produce jobs. So let's wait until this situation improves, and then we send the law. And there's two things I could not send to the two, uh, three things, three things. I could not sent to the parliament because of the earthquake that took the last days completely. One was the possibility of, uh, to advance in a, in a possible labor reform. Second, one thing that in December or, or November, I have given to my minister the, the task of uh, create a building a, a bill regarding uh, um, increasing maternal leave now in Chile it's like 74 days, some days before the, the birth and uh, like two months and a little bit more after the birth, paid by the state. And we wanted to increase it to something, four months or six months, whatever. And the third was uh, state administrators of pensions. But the earthquake took all our energies and we just couldn't do nothing about it. But now from other part, we'll try to continue doing those things too, helping in those things. Um, Roberto Warashi asked a question about the hardest moment in our relation with Argentina. I would say the first year of government, while Nelson Kirchner was the president, uh, there was a toughest winter, and there was some lack of gas. So there was some uh, situation where sometimes, well, we received gas. At that time, we received gas from Argentina. Uh, natural gas, I'm talking. Uh, so we started talking to President Kirchner how we could solve this, because the winter was hard for the Argentinians, but also for the Chileans, and that we couldn't be continue uh, with, uh, without the uh, necessary gas. So we find some ways of solving it, because when there's good relation between the, the presidents, you can try to find ways uh, considering the interest of both nations. But at the same time, it was an opportunity because uh, this was not the first time it happened, this kind of situation. And so when I came into office, I said immediately to my Minister of Min uh, Minery and Mining and Energy, we have to develop a new energy, energy policy where we'll not be dependent on one source, on one country of en that provides energy. So now what we did, we built two plants of, uh, of, of gas, and we are buying from many countries, they bring it from cheap. So we are, I mean, it makes us uh, creatively develop a lot of different, we are developing a lot of renewable energies. We're working on solar energy, on wind, on um, grass and biomass, in all kinds of renewables. So uh, if we, I, first of all, I want to say, we did have this situation we solve it uh, through dialogue and, and understanding between two countries. And with Argentina, we increasingly develop uh, closer and closer relationships. We sign a strategic association. And the 5th of April of uh, 2000, no, 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 it wasn't the 5th of April. Well, I don't remember the exact day, but President Cristina Fernandez went to Santiago and in the same place where O'Higgins and San Martin 
make his big embracement, we embrace ourselves and sign the new uh, association between Chile and Argentina. And I said, this was the new treaty, uh, point zero point zero, two point zero point femme, because there were two <laughs> women who were working together, so Argentina and Chile will have a better possibility. <laughs> and uh, Roberto M M Menendez asked about which was my role in the reform of the criminal justice system, the best in Latin America, he said? Yes. Well, I should say I had an essential role, but really I had no role at all in this because it was made during President Frey's government. Uh, it, the one who had a role here was uh, Senator uh, uh, Alvear, who was the Minister of Justice. I had no role in it, but it is pretty good. Uh, it is good, and we have been working with some other countries, Mexico, Paraguay, and some others, to share experience on, on this uh, system. And now we have to reform the civil, uh, civil justice. And, but it has been working pretty well, of course. It's not perfect, but uh, we're improving it every day. I thought you deserved Roberto's question after the tough ones on labor and uh, Argentina. Unfortunately, so. I was not the one. <laughs> Uh, two more very quick questions, uh, and uh, one is about education. This is from the internet, from Karina Smith. Uh, how has Chile's program, Chile Grows With You, impacted Chile since its inception? Why did you decide to prioritize early childhood development? And the second one uh, is, what was your experience running as a woman in 2005, and do you think your gender was ultimately an asset or a detriment? Well, Chile Grows With You, it's a special program from children, for children, in order to uh, give integral attention to the children and to the pregnant woman. So it starts when the woman is pregnant and goes to the health facility. She is included in a special program who means a lot of attentions in the health facility, but also at, at home when the child is born. We included a, how do you call this, a special package. Uh, that was not an original idea for me. I saw it in Finland. Every uh, woman who has a child in Finland receives a huge package uh, with a crib and, uh, and, and, and clothes and a lot of things so the family can start in a good way uh, protecting and caring for children. Of course, in Finland, it's for everybody. We started for the 40% of the, Ch the Chilean women who had birth in public hospitals because they're the ones, more vulnerable ones. Uh, and children will be um, attended, not attended, taking care in, in health facilities and uh, until they are six, I mean, with a special program. And also nurses, we tripled the nurseries and we increased in, in incredibly kindergartens because we believed and the reason we each, I prioritized. Even though when I was a candidate, I spoke to many people and I went to some think tanks where they told me that it was incredibly expensive, so I shouldn't do nothing about it. I really believe that uh, inequality starts from the, from, the, from the cradle. And if you don't fight from the cradle, trying to level the play field, it will be very difficult in lifetime to be able to sort out all the obstacles that for a poor child or for a poor young, young person, uh, life uh, poses. So um, I believe really as a pediatrician, as a mother, but as a pediatrician, that child are born with its best of it. And if a society gives the opportunity of developing all these capacities, all its uh, possibilities, really we're, we're giving them equal opportunities to be great people in the future, great young people, great adults, people more happy and that can be, had better life. So that's why I decided maybe it's expensive, but you need to do those kind of things to really not talk rhetorically of helping, uh, of um, uh, improving people's life, to do concrete things that improve people's lives. On the other hand, 
why I prioritize. All the studies, many made here in the United States, and probably many made in California too, demonstrate that when a child gives, receives uh, love, protection, will be a young person who will be in best condition to, with its peer, to say no to things they have to say no. On the other hand, abused child, abandoned child. I mean, it's not a rule, but it's, it's more frequent that they, they could go into delinquency, to disadapted behaviors, drugs, or alcohol. It's not that one plus one is two, but it has been seen in, the stu in research that it is, like I would say, uh, it won't promote good, healthy behavior, society's social behavior. So I thought that if we protect children in, 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 in nurseries and kindergartens and help the families that sometimes have very little possibilities of giving their children the best, this will also be good for the whole society, for the children, for the women, and, and also the woman can get a job or can look after a job, and for the whole society. And uh, so even though it could be expensive, I, I believe that it's the same thing that when this, I discuss with a lot of people about malnutrition. In some countries, and excuse me to say this because I've heard from people from those countries, uh, well, child's on both. So for some people, malnutrition is not a very interesting political issue. And on the other hand, it looks as it's expensive, but really, if you consider the consequences and the cost of somebody who had malnutrition, all the diseases, the deficit of intellectual deficit that could have had because of uh, diseases and, mal uh, and severe malnutrition, and so on, really, it's much more but much less expensive to put all your efforts in the initial times than to not do nothing about it and have to pay the consequences. So even not only from the ethical and social point of view that for me is essential, and that was the main reason why they made these decisions, from the economic point of view, it's also a bad decision not to, for example, put money in the struggle against malnutrition, in the struggle against hunger, and of course, uh, in the struggle for uh, happier, healthier, uh, safer children. I think is the best in be in best in, in best investment you can do in a country. So I have no doubt about it. And regarding gender as an asset or detriment, well, I always thought it was an asset. <laughs> Even though it had its moment. <laughs> and there's things, maybe I talked to some of you when I was here about some of this issue, but it's really incredible. For me, I was a good student. I won all the prizes and awards at my school. Nobody ever. Uh, discuss my competence as a child, as a doctor. I led a group of uh, interns in, and we were very successful. And nobody, there were men and women uh, doctor residents and nobody who, as a pediatrician, and nobody, I never heard something like, is she competent because she's a woman? And suddenly you are a candidate <laughs> for a president, and you start hearing the most amazing things. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it because in my whole life, this has, I have never had this situation. Of course I had the situation that many have, that I give a good idea, and I work with all men in that time. And all of them look at me and said, okay, let's continue discussing, and then Afterwards, one of my friends said the same, 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 same idea, but with a little more, you know, beautiful words on, and everybody said, brilliant. <laughs> you are a genius. 
Well, this sort of thing happens to women that has to show doubled or tripled they're good enough. Have you ever had that experience? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, there was this minister of Spain who came to Chile, and she talked the same thing. Because you believe in Europe, that doesn't happen. <laughs> but it did. Uh, so, but it's a, it's a matter of evolution. Because now in Chile, I'm not going to say it would be too, maybe too optimistic to say that nobody thinks that women are not competent. No, I would say nobody dares to say out loud <laughs> that women are incompetent. <laughs> and I think it's important because, I mean, it was a problem, as I said, because women speak softer. And if you don't, I read, uh, because I spoke this thing in some other place, and there was a woman regarding the time when there was the primaries here, and Hillary mm -hmm. and President Obama. She asked herself if these things that I had said, that for example, if President Lagos was moved by something, and his eyes were a little bit watering, and his, his uh, um, throat throat was like closed, everybody said, oh, how good to have a president who is sensible. <laughs> if it happened to me, she's an hysterical. <laughs> she cannot control, I mean, I'm talking about the media. <laughs> she cannot control her emotions, <laughs> and so and so. And if a politician man was big, I would say, he was strong. <laughs> and I was the fatty. <laughs> so, let me tell you something. I'm not complaining, eh? I'm just trying to describe to you how things were at the beginning. And journalists ask you things you would never imagine somebody said, tell me, um, do you have to take your children to the psychiatrist? And I said to him, did you ask that any time to President Elwin Frey Lagos or to General Pinochet? <laughs> 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 when I'm telling you these things, it's because what I try to point out is every time any of us, any of us, starts something new, we'll have to confront with prejudices, we'll have to confront with resistance to change, and that is normal. And I knew that would happen. Sometimes it wasn't pleasant, I have to tell you. But I knew it, was, it came with the, with the suit, you know? It came with the job. And that if I could be successful in this, of course could I fail, uh, I would be opening doors and windows for so many women and men because they will free themselves of prejudices. Mm -hmm. yeah. Many men have told me thank you because I have three little girls and I don't want them to have uh, a bad time in the future. I want to, to have all the possibilities. So I would tell you to be a woman, and I said, if the, if the voice is not so strong, you know, they, some people hear it as weakness. And because sometimes, I mean, the pants, Margaret Thatcher has his style, I had another style. And, <laughs> In Chile, we ask, could you please bring me that and that? I mean, and I did not say, Gonzalez, bring me that. <laughs> I said, Mr. Gonzalez, could you please bring me that and that? And for some people, that is a consideration for others. And for others, could be seen as weakness, you see? And I was talking about this article who appeared, I think, in the New York Times. And there was a women journalist who asked himself, is it true that this happens to women? And she went to... Uh, she went to, to, to talk to some politicians, women politicians, and they told her, you know, if we don't swear, everybody believes we're weak. <laughs> so we have to be like tough and swearing and stuff. And she went to Wall Street, that was before the crisis. And women, <laughs> very important women in the crisis, they said exactly the same thing. 
So what I'm trying to say, and this can happen to a man who starts something new, it's, it, you will be confronting difficulties, cultural difficulties, because that's natural, it's normal. And, uh, if you, and if you, as I did, decide to be a president as a woman, not as a man, of course this will happen. But at the end, you know, it's much better because people know that you're doing things that you really believe in. You're not posing or disguising yourself as something else. So your credibility uh, will, is, uh, will be maintained. And on the other hand, people uh, acknowledge that there are some things that women do or styles that women uh, develop that can be very good for the society because the social protection, the empowerment of women, the, the, the conviction that children are essential, that older people need dignifying conditions of life. I mean, I'm not saying this is a women issue, but it's also a women issue, you know? And also to introduce gender issues like uh, struggle against domestic violence. Uh, and, 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 and many other things, as I said, equal salary to equal job and so on. And something that I didn't have any success, any success at all. It was balance between men and women in politics. Because even though I sent not a quarter exactly uh, 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 law, bill, it was, I thought, mostly of our members of parliament don't like this. So how could we push so we have a better balance of women uh, in uh, uh, elected uh, uh, positions? Because we have only 12% of in the House, and I think two or 3% in the Senate of women. And that does not represent our women's capacity in Chile. So I thought the most oldest incentive of the world Fortunately, unfortunately, it's not love. It was money. <laughs> Parties who will bring more, take more women candidates will receive more money. But especially parties who will put women in place that they will win. Because usually they put candidates, but in place that will never win. Because the other is so strong, there has no possibilities. But there is sleeping that bill in the parliament. So I did have no success in this. But I would say, as that little girl just <laughs> mentioned, uh, we have to continue working to uh, improve democracy. Because I think that if women in Chile, as in the United States or whatever, has the same opportunities as men, uh, this will be a more democratic system. And I always say something that, um, I mean, I've learned in life that you have to find arguments that people can hear and understand. So I think now that we are soon, and I will be there because I was invited, going to South Africa, <laughs> to the World Football Cup, Soccer Cup. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was supposed to be my last question. Just, just to mention. No, it, that's what it is. Wait, Let me wait, ask wait, you, you a very tough, challenging wait, question wait, wait, from wait, the wait, audience. Wait. How will Chile do in the World Cup? <laughs> But I will use first the example of the World Cup to talk about what I was just talking. Uh, you know Marcelo Bielsa? He's an Argentinian. He's the national coach. He has been great. He's a great coach. He's a great role model for our young people. He believes in teamwork, discipline, uh, and I've asked people when they ask me, don't you think this gender issue is a little bit too much and so on? I said, could you imagine that Marcelo Bielsa would go to South Africa and try to win, or at least to have very good positions, with the half of the football selection? Well, to do that is the same to close opportunities for more than a half of Chilean population that are women. So that's why we need men and women, and we need a whole national selection so we can have the best result possible 
in South Africa in the next times. <laughs> and I will be there sharing our, our, and, and supporting our team, at least in the first game. <laughs> We have time for two more very, very quick questions. But before we go to these final two questions, they're very brief, I just want to take a moment to say three thank yous. Uh, first, to the staff and the volunteers of the Center for Latin American Studies who put so much into organizing this. A very special thank you for the very special role uh, that Professor Beatrice Montz played in all this. And of course, the honor that President Bachelet gave to all of us at UC Berkeley and this broader community to make Berkeley her first stop after completing her term as president. It was a great honor, but it was dwarfed by the enormous pleasure and excitement our students, staff, faculty, and community got from the time she's been here in Berkeley. Thank you. So, uh, I don't want to duck the last two questions, but they are especially tough. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Professor Mats. There is one tough question that I already asked. How will Chile do in the World Cup? <laughs> That's the question. Well, I don't know, because I, the only thing I know uh, is that they're going to be there playing with all of their hearts. And that's what I think must be applause. <laughs> Of course, we hope we'll do well, of course. <laughs> and now we're going to end with a cueca by the trio Arauco. Great.
Thank you.